Hi. The last few sessions, we've looked at different strands of value investing. We started by looking at passive screening, where you follow Ben Graham's footsteps and you screen for the cheapest stocks by looking for companies that have low P ratios, low price to book ratios, and also have something else going for them, good fundamentals. In the second, we looked at value investing from a contrarian standpoint, where we invest in companies where something bad has happened, bad in terms of stock prices, bad in terms of performance. Implicitly, we're assuming that markets tend to overreact and we want to make money off that correction of that overreaction. In the third, we looked at activist value investors who come in and buy cheap companies but don't just sit back but try to change that company, change that company's stock prices, change the way it's run, and hope to make money off it. Through it all, the fundamental principle we were enunciating was value investors tend to do better than the market. In fact, value investors, if you got them together in one spot, will often argue that they are better investors than the rest of the market. And given how much empirical evidence backs up value investing, that seems like a pretty legitimate point, right? You would expect value investors to do better than everybody else in the market. But do they? In this session, I want to look at the evidence on the ground on whether va value investing, at least in the form that it's sold to us as active value investing, where you go in and you try to find cheap stocks, does that actually work? And let's start with perhaps the most depressing evidence on value investing. Early in these sessions, I talked about how the services classify value investors. Basically, they classify value investing versus growth investing based on the kinds of companies you invest in. So if you invest in low P ratio companies, you're usually classified as a value investor. Given the weakness of that distinction, it's still worth looking at whether if you classify investors into value investors and growth investors and perhaps something in the middle that we'll call blend investors, whether you beat the market. And let's look at the actual evidence. So what this is actually is the difference in returns between the average active value investor and a value index fund, the average active growth investor in the growth index fund. In other words, I'm not looking at value stocks versus growth stocks. We know what the evidence suggests there, which is value stocks beat growth stocks. I'm looking at should you just buy an index fund of cheap companies, you know, low PE, low price to book companies, or should you actually go out and do research to find the cheapest value companies? And this is where the evidence seems to cut against value investing. If you look at the payoff to active value investing, you look at the average active value mutual fund versus a value index fund, versus the active actual, you know, average active growth fund versus a growth index fund, you find something very interesting. Value, active value funds tend to underperform value index funds by more than active growth funds underperform growth index funds. You're saying, what does that tell me? It tells me that if you're going to spend your time collecting information, picking stocks, at least based on this overall evidence, it looks like the payoff to doing that research and finding the cheaper stocks is greater if you're a growth investor than if you're a value investor. Troubling, right? Because all everything we've been told is that be a good value investor, you're going to make money. And this suggests that if you follow the pathway of conventional value investing, you do, do your homework, you try to find cheap companies, at least on average, looking across what mutual funds do, it doesn't look like there's much of a payoff. In fact, there's a negative payoff. Well, you're saying that might be mutual funds. Mutual funds are not always religious about the way they stick to a philosophy. Maybe the evidence is a little better with individual investors, and you'd be right on that dimension. A study, a study by Barber and Ordain in the 1990s actually looked at individual investors. They actually got their hands on the brokerage accounts of thousands of individual investors, and the names are obviously disguised. And while they discovered that the average individual in investor underperformed the indices by about 1%, which is very much in line with what you find with the average mutual fund, they did find an optimist. There was one optimistic slice to their findings, which is they discovered that the top performing quarter, quartile of individual investors outperformed the market by about 6%. In other words, the top 25% of individual investors do much better than the market. Okay. So that's, 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 that suggests that at least some individual investors beat the market. Now, as follow-up, 
There are other studies that's, that look at the phenomenon of individual investing, and they actually find that contrary to all the lessons about diversification, investors with more concentrated portfolios outperform those with more diversified portfolios. Now, nothing in these studies looked at whether these investors are value or growth investors, but if I were to hazard a guess, I would expect value investors to be more concentrated in their portfolios because that's another lesson you're taught in value investing. Buy only six or eight great companies. Don't spread, spread your bets too much. If you bring these two, two findings together, at least on a loose basis, you could argue that maybe there is slightly more optimistic evidence when you look at individual investors that individual value investors do beat the market. They're not by enough to kind of stand out collectively. Now let's look at activist investors. Do they do well? Well, they seem to. And if you look across all activist investors, they do have positive excess returns. But if you look at the three groups of activist investors we talked about, activist mutual funds, activist private equity funds, private equity slash hedge funds, and activist individual investors, lone wolves, activist mutual funds seem to have the worst track record. They have very little evidence of value added from all the work they do. And that shouldn't be surprising. Many activist mutual funds are not that activist. They don't push too hard. They give up too easily. Activist hedge funds, private equity investors, do much better. On average, at least, they deliver 6, 7, 8% more than the rest of the market. The high end, about 20% more. And individual investors, loan, loan wolves, fall somewhere in the middle, with the most successful among them ranking with the hedge funds and the least successful ranking with the mutual funds. Having said that, there are two things I need to add. One is those average excess returns you see from activist investors are not stable over time. You have great years and you have terrible years. You've got to live through the terrible years to make money in the great years, which is part of the reason survival is a big factor here. To be a successful activist investor over time, you've got to survive, and sometimes these bad years can wipe you out. The other feature of the returns that jumps out at you when you look at the returns to activist investing is it's a very skewed distribution. You think, what the heck does that even mean? Basically, what it means is that when you see these 6 to 8 percent average excess returns, they reflect the fact that the big winners here make huge amounts of money. They make 200, 300 percent returns, pulling up the averages. In fact, there are studies that indicate that for most activist investors, if you factor in the costs of being an activist investor, mounting proxy contests, challenging management, that those costs actually eat away all your excess returns for most activist investors. But the big winners are really big winners. So collectively, at least, the evidence is not very good if you look at value mutual funds, a little better when you look at individual value investors, and mixed when you look at activist value investors. So why doesn't value investing work much better? I mean, given that it has such a solid basis in the empirical evidence, and it seems to come with so much rigor, what are the reasons it fails? And this is my personal bias view about why most value investors, I think, fail. And as I said, take it, I mean, you might have very different views on this, but this is why I think value investing fails. And I trace it back to what I call the three big R's of value investing. The first is value investing as we know it, as it's evolved over time, it's become extraordinarily rigid. Lots of hard and fast rules. You shouldn't invest in a stock if it's, you know, if its P-E ratio is greater than X. You shouldn't invest in stock if this, this, and this are not true. It's become very rigid, and being rigid in investing is a dangerous place to be. You have to be adaptable. You have to be flexible. The second thing that bothers me about a lot of value investors, not all of them, is that many of them are very righteous about what they do. They believe that they are the chosen ones, that they do the homework, that they deserve the high returns, that everybody else in the market deserves to be t is treated with contempt. Those guys who look at, look at charts are basically, you know, moon gazers. The um, academics are, you know, navel gazers. I mean, essentially, you've taken the rest of the world and said, they have nothing to offer. We know everything there is to know. And again, that's a very dangerous place to be in investing, is to assume that you're right and everybody else is wrong. And the third is, it's become very ritualistic. Ritualistic in what sense? If you tell somebody you're a value investor, they put you through a series of tests. Have you read Security Analysis by Ben Graham? And if you say no, they say, no, you're not a value investor. Have you been to Omaha? What do you think about Warren Buffett? It's almost as if 
there's a, there's a questionnaire you're required to answer, a series of tasks you're supposed to accomplish become, before you become a value investor. And most of these have nothing to do with investing success. So what I'd like to do is actually take you through six misconceptions that I see as pervasive in modern value investing. And I think getting rid of these misconceptions will make you a better value investor even if you buy into the notion of value investing. Second, don't, first, don't be so quick to abandon discounted cash flow valuation. When people talk about discounted cash, when, when you talk to most value investors about a discounted cash flow value, they're quick to say, well, that's an academic exercise. I'd never do a discounted cash flow value. I don't like, and essentially then they jump into models. It's, but if you step back and think about what discounted cash flow is saying, it's actually at the core of value investing. It's saying the value of a business is the present value of the expected cash flows of the business. So th if you think of what's embedded in that, cash flows are embedded, growth is embedded, risk is embedded, the time value of money is embedded. These predate finance as we know it. Good business people through the ages have always looked at these when they value a business. So look past the equations and the models and look at the core of discounted cash flow valuation because here are the three propositions that emerge from it. First, for something to have value, it has to affect the cash flows or the discount rates. If you as a value investor keep talking to me about moats or good management, what I'm trying to do in a discounted cash flow valuation is convert those very good things into cash flows or effects on risk. Second, if you tell me a business has value, and that business has negative cash flows for as far as the eye can see. I don't see it. So the second proposition is for an asset or a business to have value. The cash flows have to be positive at some point in time. The third proposition that comes right out of that equation is if you have a business with negative cash flows up front, value investors might be quick to get rid of those investments saying those are not good investments if the cash flows are negative. But in a discounted cash flow world, it's entirely possible that you could have businesses with negative cash flows up front have high value if you get disproportionately large positive cash flows. So discounted cash flow valuation is a tool. It's agnostic. It doesn't push you towards value investing or growth investing. It's just a way of thinking about what drives the value of an asset. And I think every value investor needs to at least have discounted cash flow valuation in his or her toolbox. Here's a second misconception, and this drives me crazy. When you talk to value investors, one of the first things they ask you again is, do you use betas? And if you say yes, you're, you're off the reservation. You're, in a sense, beyond redemption. So for many value investors, the fact that you use beta essentially means you bought into modern portfolio theory, which also then means that you don't try to pick stocks. So there's this whole set of other beliefs they attribute to you if you use betas. I use betas in valuation all the time, and there are lots of value investors who will not even look at the details of what they do because all they see is the beta and then they run away. So here's what I'd like to do. Rather than think about beta from the conventional risk and return portfolio theory standpoint, where you get to it by assuming that risk is measured with variance and that investors are diversified and that beta then measures the risk added to a diversified portfolio, I'm going to state two propositions about betas, and I think these are generic propositions that you should be able to buy into even if you don't buy any of the stuff that goes into the derivation of beta. First, beta is a measure of relative risk. Basically, all I'm saying when a stock has a beta 1.5 is that it's one and a half times more risky than the average stock in the market. As I mentioned in my, dis in my session on risk, I am agnostic about how you come up with this relative risk measure. So if you as a value investor don't buy into the traditional cap and beta, and you come up with a different measure, way of measuring relative risk, I'm with you. What I'm not with is somebody who says, look, because I don't buy into beta, I'm not going to try to measure relative risk. Effectively, you're saying all investments are equally risky, and that I don't get. The second broad measure, or broad thing to think about beta, is beta does draw a distinction between risk of a company standing alone and risk added to a portfolio. That's not geek theory, it's not the cap M, it's basic common sense. If you have a portfolio, you have to think about the risk added to that portfolio. And I think that debate is again worth having, even if you don't buy into beta as your measure of risk. So just because you don't like betas doesn't mean you have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Think about ways of measuring relative risk and think of how you will judge an investment based on its total risk or the risk added to a portfolio. Third misconception. 
I know that many value investors like margin of safety, and I like it too. Basically, the margin of safety is the difference between the price and the value, that trigger at which you decide to buy a stock. So if you tell me your margin of safety is 20%, or 30%, you're telling me you would buy a stock only if the price drops 30% below its value. Excellent. But here are the things I don't buy about margin of safety. First, margin of safety comes into play at the end of a process. You have to come up with the value first before you use a margin of safety. So it's not a risk measure that competes with bait or any other risk measure because I need a risk measure to value a company. I can't wait till the end. So margin of safety does not become a substitute for assessing risk. It's not a replacement for beta. Even if you buy into margin of safety and you go with it, it shouldn't be a fixed number for every company. If I am valuing a company and I feel very secure about its value, it's a, it's a stable company with predictable margins, my margin of safety can be far smaller than if I'm valuing a young growth company where there's a lot more uncertainty. So if nothing else, the margin of safety should vary across companies, it should vary across time, depending on whether I'm in a stable environment or a crisis environment. And finally, if you become too conservative, and you can become too conservative and set your margin of safety at too big a number, it's true, the stocks you buy might be incredible bargains, but here's the cost. You might not be able to find much to buy, in which case the bulk of your portfolio is going to sit around in cash, and that's not a great place to be. So this is trade-off that has to be factored in. If you, in my view, if you're a large portfolio manager, you're investing billions of dollars, you can't afford to have a margin of safety, be a large number because you're not going to find enough investments that meet that large number threshold. So margin of safety is fine, but use it for the right reason. Use it at the end of the process as a way of protecting yourself against estimation risk and let it vary across your investments. Fourth misconception about valuation. If I find a company with good management, I can just buy the stock and forget about it. That's a dangerous, dangerous argument to make. Because when you have a company with good management and the market recognizes that this company has good management, the expectations for this company set, get set higher, right? I actually think well-managed companies that are regarded as well-managed are actually more risky than companies that are badly managed. Because to me, risk is not how much your actual results vary over time. It's how much your actual results are different from your expected results. So if expectations get set too high on a good company, you can have a lot of risk because there's a much greater chance that the actual numbers don't meet up to expectations. So I would not equate good management with low risk because good management, if everybody else thinks it's good management, can actually be a high risk. In fact, when I see value investors use the screen of good management, it's often so fuzzy. It's basically, I'll know it when I see it, that I don't think it's useful. In fact, I think in most cases it does more damage than good to bring in a good management screen into your value investing strategy. Misconception number five. I know that value investors make a big deal about moats. We talked about this as one risk measure. Basically, a moat tells you what how big the barriers to entry are in a business and, and how good your competitive advantages are. Do I care about moats? Absolutely. In fact, when I do discounted cash flow evaluation, a lot of my value comes from my assumptions about how wide the moat is and how difficult it is to cross. Having said that, though, I would not jump to the conclusion that just because a company has really strong competitive advantages, really high barriers to entry, really wide moats, that it's a good investment. And here's why. Again, if the market sees this company as having a wide moat and prices it in. I have to measure how good or bad an investment is based on not how, how, how wide the moat is, but how wide the moat is relative to the expectations. So the market is pricing in Google with an incredibly wide moat and it just has a very wide moat. That's a negative surprise. That makes Google a bad investment. Conversely, if the market is pricing GM on the assumption that there are no moats at all, and GM has this tiny moat, that's a positive surprise. So how big or small your competitive advantages are have to be measured up against ex expectations, and that's what determines whether an investment is a good investment or a bad investment. Finally, there is this misconception among value investors that somehow intrinsic value is this nice, stable number that once you estimate it, will not change over time. That might make you feel comfortable, but it's not true. The intrinsic value of an asset will change all the time. It'll change all the time, not just because there's information coming out about the company, about its revenues, about its margins, about its growth prospects, but macroeconomic variables change. The price of risk changes. So if you bought a stock 
in 2007, you held it through 2009, your intrinsic value changed as a result of the crisis. Risk premiums went up, the value went down. So if you are doing intrinsic valuation, you have to revisit those valuations because just because you've done it one doesn't mean that that number is going to stay constant over time. There's also a feedback effect that we often ignore, which is that we act like the intrinsic value is completely separated from the price, but that's not true. The price is an input into the intrinsic valuation process, whether you like it or not. So there can be feedback effects where as your value changes and your price changes, new investors come in and the value can change again. So I think that we have to think about intrinsic value as a flexible process and a number that can change on a period to period basis. So value investors, if you present them with the evidence that the actual numbers don't look that good for mutual funds, even for individual investors, perhaps even for activists, if you don't count the biggest winners, fall back on the final defense. And you know what that is, right? How do you explain Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett becomes the answer to every question you ask about value investing. If you keep naming the same three or four or five successful value investors every time this, pro this question comes up in practice, you've already admitted failure because you're talking about the exception rather than the rule. If after 50 years or 60 years of looking through value investors, you keep coming up with the same names, that's not a sign of strength to me. So I think a more telling test of value investors, whether value is maybe perhaps I should go to Omaha next year. Take a list of names of everybody who comes to Omaha because after all, these are the true value investors, right? And track the returns they make on their portfolios. Right? That would be a good test, right? I don't think anybody has done it, and maybe it's worth doing. But I think that we need to be honest, we as value investors, and I think I classify myself as partially at least a value investor, though not the kind of rabid value investor that jumps down other people's throat. I think we need to be honest with ourselves about whether value investing works. So the bottom line, can, if, you, if you bring all this together, value investing comes in lots of different forms. There are screeners, there are activist value investors, there are contrarians. While the evidence is pretty strong backing up, on, backing up value investing, the actual returns delivered by investors who call themselves value investors is not as impressive. For whatever reason, most investors who call themselves value investors don't seem to at least deliver the kinds of returns you see on paper for value investing. So I would say caveat emptor, if you're going to become a value investor, do so for the right reasons. Walk in with open eyes. The game is not going to be an easy one to win just because you become a value investor. It's still a very difficult game to win, and most value investors don't seem to win it. Thank you very much for listening.